a month so you can do your research. Okay? So we were finally Okay, so we were finalists in the 2015 challenge and that is why we were allowed to get tweets that were labeled with the following hashtags. Diabetes, pregnancy, and gestational diabetes. And the database was made available for us for tweets that were sent from 2010 when the healthcare hashtag project started to 2015. So we had five years. Now, when you go on simpler signals, it will allow you to filter results. So, for example, we wanted only tweets sent by women, not by men, not by healthcare professionals, not by organizations. It has to be the pregnant. Here, we already, if we're going to get scared about how powerful the database is, it can actually tag patients. Okay? So, however, these are the seven search strategies we use. Uh, tweet translate are conversational, static, manually search because some of the Twitter profiles were marked as unknown. They don't know who is tweeting or not. Now, if you are trying to do a Twitter content analysis, uh, please know that here we already have a Twitter content classification from Dan. So, he classifies tweets into the following, whether they are conversational, by status tweets into the following, personal, temporal, mechanical, physical work, and automated, and activity. So what we did to investigators is that independently map each status tweet we harvested to a construct of the health belief model. So what were the results? Using the seven search strategies that we had, we had 6,433 tweets to begin with. Now, the database identified 1,024 tweets as by patient. But for the rest of the tweets, 4,206 tweets. In terms of the past along tweets, we found 239 tweets with links um, showing 93 unique domains. Now, all in all, 1,548 tweets were coded for content. Okay? So we were able to subdivide that into women with pre-gestational diabetes and women who had gestational diabetes. Because we had access to the before this session, we were discussing the ethics of it. Um, we can say, for example, that 24 women in our sample because they specified so on their profiles and 16 of them were actually bloggers. For the women with gestation, we had four women from the Filipino oh, on your Twitter profile. You also have a location. So most of the women were from the U.S. We had one woman from Singapore and Japan. So I'm sure most of you know the health belief model. Okay, so we're trying to gain an insight. Uh, into the, you know, uh, behavior of these gestational diabetes women to see how we can help them. So there are several constructs, perceived seriousness, susceptibility, benefits and barriers, self-efficacy, and cues to action. So two of our group actually read each and every tweet, and then we mapped it to the construct. And um, differences in the mapping, we had to do it by consensus, where we would actually map it. So this is the distribution of tweets according to the constructs. And what you have in the blue bars would be the women who had diabetes before the pregnancy, pre-gestational. And then the yellow bars would be the women with gestational diabetes. They only got diagnosed during the pregnancy. So you can see that while tweets relating to barriers predominated in both groups. What we did to investigators is that interview, and we took the extra step of running those tweets in Google to see if they will point back to the profiles. Because we don't want that. We don't want the women to be identified based on the tweets that they sent. Okay? So these are some of the representative tweets for perceived severity. So, for example, heading to an ultrasound to see how big baby girl is. Hashtag gestational diabetes. Or perceived susceptibility. Ayan, Tagalog pa siya. Damn pregnancy hormones. Kung kailan, malapit na. Or perceived benefits of eating healthy. Or sabi niya dito, I will do anything for love. Poke my finger seven times a day and get shots four times a day. Gestational diabetes, baby love. Perceived barriers. Cheating on a diet and feeling like a murderer while you frantically hide the evidence. Okay, so we actually, you know, smile and laugh, but for me, this is an opportunity to actually see what are the patients saying. They don't tell it to us in the clinic, 
but they are actually tweeting about it. So, perceived barriers. So, if we look at the percentages, because we try to look at it, most of the tweets, 61%, were on food restriction and hunger. So, we need to support these women more that they do not need to feel guilty. Okay? And for the pre-gestational diabetes, what is the most number of tweets? Emotional. Okay? 33% of the tweets. So, perceived bars are more emotional, such as feelings of helplessness, loss of control, and anger, were more common than tweets about dietary restrictions for the pre-gestational diabetes. So, ibang-iba po siya dun sa gestational. Perceived barriers. Dahil ang tweets talking about, do they tweet user-generated content, meaning their own blogs? Or do they endorse um, content known agencies, for example, the American Diabetes Association, okay? So, we look at whether the blogs that were tweeted or the sites that were tweeted had the home code. The home code is the help from the NET Foundation. And if your website has the seal, it ensures quality, objectivity, and transparency of medical information online. So, out of the 93 unique domains, all had the home code seal. So, that's something we worry about. Women with pre-existing diabetes shared blog posts, 67%. While those who have gestational diabetes dealing with diabetes for the first three shared links for new sites. See, the behavior is different. They had type 1 diabetes because they specified so on their profiles, and 16 of them were actually blocked. Women with diabetes are often limited during the pregnancy. The women with gestational diabetes, we had four women from the Philippines because, as you know, on your Twitter profile, you also have a location. Examining tweets of pregnant women with diabetes has identified issues that are important to them, the patients. These include dietary restrictions, lab tests. Okay? So we're trying to gain an insight uh, into the you know, uh, behavior of these gestational diabetes women to see how we can help them. So there are several constructs. Content analysis of tweets show that women with gestational diabetes and pre-existing diabetes have this of our group actually read each and every tweet. And then we mapped it to the constructs. So this is the distribution of tweets according to the constructs. And what are often during consultations, the women who had diabetes before the pregnancy, pre-gestational, and then the yellow bars would be the women with gestational diabetes. They only got diagnosed during the pregnancy. So you can see that while tweets relating to barriers, I caught the tail end of track to earlier. Somebody was raising the point that this is generalized only to that subset of women. And that is true. Remember, action were fewer for women with gestational diabetes. Now here is the part where as I was discussing with Dr. Kalimag, um, we had to show representative tweets, okay? And we took the extra step of in Google to see if they will point back to the profiles because we don't want that. We don't want the women to be identified based on the tweets that they sent, okay? So these are some of the representative tweets for perceived severity. So, for example, heading to an ultrasound to see how big baby girl is. Hashtag gestational diabetes. Or perceived susceptibility, ayan, agad. or perceived benefits of eating healthy, or sabi niya dito, I will do anything for love. Poke my finger seven times a day and shots four times a day. Gestational diabetes, baby love. Warriors, cheating on a diet and feeling like a murderer while you frantically hide the evidence. Okay, so we actually, you know, smile and laugh, but for me to actually see what are the patients saying. Supposed to be the moderator. Our next uh, presenter, um, he will be, he is from the Department of um, Information. So, perceived barriers. So, if we look at the percentages, because we try to look at it, 61% were on food restriction and hunger. So we need to support these women more that they do not need okay? And for the pre-gestational diabetes, what is the most number of tweets? Emotional, okay? 33% of the tweets. So perceived bars are more emotional, such as feelings of helplessness. iba po siya dun sa gestational. Perceived barriers. It's implication. And lastly, I would like to 
uh, segue to a project that DOST is funding right now, which is called Project Faster. So for the context, I divided it into three. Uh, the e-health status in the Philippines, next is the extended e-health framework is now being revised. We have now the National Unified Health Research Agenda, or the NURA. But for... Okay. So we looked at whether the blogs that were tweeted or the sites that were tweeted had the HON code. The HON code is the help from the NET Foundation. And if your website has the seal, it ensures quality, objectivity, and transparency of medical researches, health reports, health knowledge portals, and electronic health records. So these are the EMRs. DOH has its one. Our lab has its one. Uh, but what's missing here are the latent data that we do not use, such as social media coming from Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google searches, etc. Which, let's say, the majority of the Filipinos actually use every day. So we would like to contribute there. Next, just a brief overview of two systems that the DOH currently has. The first one is called the Philippine Integrated Disease Surveillance Response System, or the PITSAR system. Uh, it, it's a surveillance system that collects data for notifiable diseases. So it, data collection starts from the barangay level, then to the municipal level, provincial level, regional level, and the national level. Uh, just by saying that, you will see that it takes time before public policies may be made at the national level and that are important to them, the patients. These include dietary restrictions, lab testing, glucose monitoring, and emotional distress. Content analysis of tweets show that women with gestational diabetes and pre-existing diabetes have differing percep perceptions of barriers and benefits. Physicians following up these women at their clinics can gain insight from the study as to what can be discussed more often during consultations and therefore be able to provide more support. So as I caught the tail end of track two earlier, somebody was raising the point that this is generalizable only to that stuff. And that is true. A newly coined term called infodemiology or information epidemiology. It's a format of information and epidemiology and it makes use of information gathered online, so such as social media, Google searches, etc. Just a brief uh, comparison between infodemiology and... I don't know how many of them are on Twitter. So I find research interesting. Filipinos are proud to call the Philippines the social media capital of the world. Please. We get data on our own or from the Department of Health, such as the existing surveillance systems, but Infodemiology, what we're trying to look at are the spread of information online uh, that are health related. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to request the other participants, you can come in front. We have vacant seats here. So I'm Dr. Rimo Aguilar, I'm supposed to be the moderator. Our next uh, presenter, um, he will be, he is from the Department of. Uh, would like to consider are the following. Not all information can be used for processing. Competency Center of Ateneo de Manila University. He is the ESP who will present his paper on using social media for syndromic surveillance. Sir? We're dealing with people who are just who are just saying what they want to say. There is a need to pre-process. Okay. So information could be gathered. Uh, again, pre-processing should be needed. Uh, is needed in the research and what's its implication. And lastly, I would like to uh, segue to a project that DOST is funding right now, which is called. So for the context, I divided it into three. Uh, the e-health status in the Philippines. Next is the ex the demo. That they Okay, for methodology, this is a general overview. First is collection of the tweets using keywords uh, we are trying to complement. And the last one, newly termed point called infodemiology. For this one, we have the here an outdated, semi-outdated e-health framework is now being revised. We have now the National Unified Health the classification methodology. What we're trying to achieve is to segregate those that could be used for health-related researches 
and versus those that is just mere tweets. Next is the need for geocoding tweets, meaning you try to locate tweets that doesn't have that don't have embedded locations in them. And lastly, would be for statistical analysis. The DOH currently has the first one is called the construction. We use the public Twitter API. Data collection starts from the barangay level, then to the municipal level, provincial level, regional level, and the national level uh, to collect. So for this one, and we're, we would like to address this discrepancy in that system. Next would be the event-based to collect or divide into three first or colloquial terms, such as or the ESR. This is much more participatory in nature than PIDs are. Uh, it, next would be symptom people to report disease incidences to the Department of Health, which the DOH could then proceed investigations. This is much more quicker, let's say, compared to the PIDs or system. Next is click point term, relatively newly coined term called infodemiology, information epidemiology. It's a format of information and epidemiology, and it makes use of information gathered online, so such as social media, Google, etc. Just a brief uh, comparison between infodemiology and epidemiology. Ep in epidemiology, what we're trying to look at are official records, official surveillance records, to create public policy. So for us, we get data on our own or from the Department of Health, such as the Resolving an average of 66,600 we're trying to look at are the spread of information online uh, that are nature or health related. So that's why there is a need for classification. So we develop uh, for demiology what we would like to consider are the following. Not all information can be used for processing. Not all information are reliable when it comes to social media. It may be, let's say, garbage, could be garbage in our terms. Uh, there is a need to pre-process. Since we're dealing with people who are just tweeting away, who are just saying what they want to say, there is a need to pre-process what they are actually trying to convey. So, next would be misinformation could be gathered. Uh, again, pre-processing should be need. Uh, is need. Ang sakit ng chan ko kanina pang uh, a spatial-temporal visualization of the tweets on a map for the Philippines. Uh, we use this one to complement an, the existing surveillance uh, surveillance systems of the Department of Health. There is a demo that they okay, For methodology, this is a general overview. First is collection of the tweets using keywords. Uh, we at the Ateneo Java Wireless Competency Center uh, created a tweet collector that has a nice UI. <laughs> user interface where you could just input the keywords you would like to collect and we would store it in a database. Next would be the classification methodology. Here, what we're trying to achieve is to segregate those that could be used in searches and tweets, meaning we try to locate tweets that, doesn't have, that don't have embedded locations in them and lastly would be for statistical analysis on regressions, etc. For tweet extraction, we use the public Twitter API. Maybe uh, this one, uh, I put Quezon City, so we get to collect that, and we run it through our algorithm. And uh, a latitude and longitude data for Quezon City is given to us. And once we run it, we try to correlate it with the those with embedded locations, and there is high correlation, so we could use this one. Next is a sample tweet visualization of the tweets. So my ethical concern palada. So there are two visualizations. First is a choropleth map or a heat map. So you could see the concentrations where the tweets are located and location point maps where you could click on the point. For this research, what we focus on was dengue, measles, and typhoid fever. So uh, symptoms such as makate, rash, rashes, namumula, etc. Next would be behaviors or indirect actions that does not necessarily uh, touch or these are just tangential terms such as luxury drug, where to buy, 
the meds or the actual medicines themselves, paracetamol, or some usual terms that we use when we are sick, such as sickleaf na naman or gamot. Okay, as a result, we consider a lot of possible dialects in the Philippines languages for health related. So that's why there is a need for classification. So we developed uh, an automated classification classification algorithm that would segregate those that are health-related or not health-related. Apparently, out of the 66,605 Filipino tweets, only 12.84% uh, related. So, we're trying to set a prototype on what possible use cases we could have for using the tweets. Create things like that. So, again, it's just 12.84%. So, around 8,556 tweets per day are tweeted out there that may be, uh, that may be considered for syndromic surveillance. Next, simple linear regression model to pro predict disease incidences. So, we, uh, I don't turn it on. So, of the 8,556, only 11% have their inherent locations turned on. So, there are around 800 tweets embedded latitude and longitude given x amount of tweets how many possible disease incidences could there be so apparently but masasayang yung remaining 89% of an algorithm that tries to locate using text based uh, input so for this one that's me <laughs> What we collect, we, we are also able to collect actually normal for them to get dengue incidences around 113. Uh, we did it for at the provincial level and the municipal level. That they put in their profile themselves. So for this one, uh, I put Quezon City so we get to collect that and we run it through our algorithm and uh, a latitude and longitude data for us. And once we run it, we try to run it. Uh, it's called Project Faster. In our lab, we could use this one. Next is a sample tweet visualization. Tweets, so my ethical concern pala dun. So, there are two visualizations. First is a choropleth map or a heat map. So, you could see the concentrations where the tweets are located and location point maps where you could click on the points and actually see the tweets themselves. So for example, the FELF, particularly the Epidemiology, Epidemiology Bureau and the Knowledge Management Press, di pa rin nawawala ubot si Ponto. So it's infodemiological, it has its location and it has a user name. This one is a temporal visualization pero hindi siyang nagpiplay. So what it would look like for year one, we created models that would predict formation from a certain date to a certain date. So the Western Visayas region. Next would be development of web in the Luzon area. One thing that you, uh, one limitation here is that we use mostly, we proposed was so Tagalog and we did not consider a lot of possible dialects in the Philippines languages, so in the Visayas region and the uh, Indonesian region. Okay, this is the last part of the research actually. Uh, syndromic surveillance aspect of the project, which would include the... After collecting all that data, after knowing that there are tweets that could be used for infodemiology, what could be done? So, a prototype on what possible use cases we could have for using the tweets. For this one, we use simple linear. Okay, just to conclude, to correlate with the data we got from Twitter. So, uh, the question we're trying to answer here is can be used as a complementary source of data for existence. How many possible disease incidences could there be? So, apparently, we use the Western Visayas region. Again, there is a discrepancy in the way we do surveillance here in the Philippines. It takes a lot of time. So, maybe. Uh, it's time for the Philippines to be able to use other sources of data such as social media. And for further research and for further, if you want, uh, we did it for at the provincial level and the municipal level. Again, 
for typhoid fever, we did the same. So it takes uh, around 100 tweets to produce, let's say, to detect uh, three, uh, three disease incidences for typhoid fever. Okay, so I'm going to continue the project. <laughs> uh, it's called Project Faster. We like to play with words. So Faster stands for Visibility Analysis of Syndrome Surveillance Using a Spatial Temporal Epidemiological Modeler for Early Detection of Disease Test. It is a project funded by the US TPCHRD, so thank you. Uh, it's a project in cooperation with the Department of Health, particularly the Epidemiology, Epidemiology Bureau and the Information Technology Services, and the uh, Atenea de Manila University. So it has three aspects to it. First is the disease outbreak modeling for the three diseases, then get typhoid fever and so this was done for year one. We created models that would predict the spread of diseases uh, at the Western Visayas region. Next would be development of web application for media and the policy group. So anyway, we go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is will be presenting the paper Lung Cancer Related Twitter Activity Among Patients and Healthcare Related Professional. Um, this is from the section of Med that We would collect data from Twitter, from online blogs, and okay. it's, not it's time for the Philippines to be able to use other sources of data such as social media. And for further research, and for further, if you want to collaborate with us, uh, uh, spatial analysis of the spread of information. Angelica Concepcion and our very own Iris, Dr. Iris Lisi. Create uh, the analysis for its spread. And lastly, is the integration of tweets as a parameter for the disease models that we have created. So for, uh, if you want to contact us, you could contact me at ksminat.ateneo.edu or Dr. Rina Estuar through rstuar at ateneo.edu. Thank you. Here to present um, our study. Um, so gestational diabetes or GDM um, our next speaker is from, will be presenting the paper, Lung Cancerology in the University of the Philippines, Philippine General. Morbidity and um, increased risk of developing future diabetes for mother. Or in some studies, it has also been found out that patients with GDM have increased anxiety in a study involving 50 people. Anyway, sorry, but we'll give time for that speaker. So our next speaker, who will talk on the main sources of anxiety and the dissatisfaction of gestational diabetes, diabetes patients determined by content and analysis of their blood. This is a study done by Ralph Jason Lee, Angelica Concepcion, and Iris, Dr. Iris Isiptan. They are from the section of endocrinology, diabetes and Meta metabolism from the Department of Medicine, and also from the section of medical oncology, Department of Medi Medicine, University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. So our next speaker is, uh, our next presenter is Ralph Jason Lee. Ralph. Hello, good morning. So, I am here to present um, our study. So, gestational diabetes or GDM um, is diabetes that is um, with onset or first recognized during pregnancy. It can be associated with um, uh, fetal and maternal complications. There can be increased perinatal mortality and morbidity and um, increased risk of developing future diabetes for mothers. However, in some studies, it has also been found out that patients with GDM have increased anxiety 